Today, we are down at a local car show where I saw this 65 Corvair Corsa. But before we take the tour, welcome to What It's Like. This channel, we feature the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars that are off the beaten path. If that sounds like something that you're interested in, hit the subscribe button. Also, turn on the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. Let's talk. 1965 Chevy offerings, Chevy 2, Corvair, Corvette, Chevelle, Malibu, the 65 Chevy, which was their full-size lineup, and they offered Biscayne, Bel Air, Impala. They also offered a variation of wagons throughout the different trim levels, except for the Corvair trim. Corvair did have a wagon at one point, but it was dropped. Moving to the Corvair for 1965, 65 was the first year of the second generation of the Corvair. But let's let's take a step back for a second. Chevy offered the Corvair from 1960 to 1969 in two generations. First generation was 1960 to 1964 in many different body variations. Two-door, two-door convertible, four-door, four-door wagon. They had a van, a ramp side truck. They even had a mobile home. Fast forward to 1965, Corvair is now offered as a two-door convertible, two-door hardtop, four-door hardtop. Corvair was offered in three series. The bottom trim level was the Corvair 500. Mid trim, Corvair Monza. Corvair Corsa was at the top. Technically, the Greenbrier van was offered in 1965 for the final year. Besides the styling, Corvair got all new four-wheel independent suspension. This is Chevy in the mid-60s. Yeah, I know the Corvette had independent suspension earlier on. Well, anyway, independent suspension, replacing the swing axle, which Ralph Nader was a huge fan of, so much so that he wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed. Do you think Chevy went independent suspension to appease Nader? Just so you're aware, Chevy... In the first generation cars, 1960 to 1964, they used a swing axle, just like any Volkswagen product from this era, as well as any Porsche from this time period. And no one complained about Volkswagen. Is it because they're German and they get a pass? Anyway, independent suspension, coil springs on each wheel. Corsa came with a standard 140 mile per hour speedometer, as well as a tripometer, 6,000 RPM redline was the tack, cylinder head temperature gauge, better brakes borrowed from the Chevelle. All right, moving on to some specs, 183.3 inches long, 108 inches is the wheelbase, 66.9 inches wide, 52.8 inches tall. The price was between $2,500 and $2,600 in 1965, which would be equivalent to you spending $23,000 $198.10 up to $24,126.02. This thing weighs 2,697 pounds. It was built on the Z body platform. Total Chevy 1965 Chevy production numbers. Chevy had a stellar year. They sold 2,375,118 units of which Total 1965 Corsa production was 28,644, and of those, 20,291 were hardtop, two-door hardtops. Average MPG was around 16 miles per gallon. 114 miles per hour was the theoretical top speed. Tires it left with from the factory were 6.5 by 13s, bias ply. Moving on to the engine segment, the base engine that came in the Corvair 500 was a 2687cc, 164 cubic inch displacement, or 2.7 liters for you metric folks. It made 95 horsepower at 3600 RPM. The bore was 3.4 inches. Stroke was 2.9 inches. Compression was 8.25 to 1. Had four main bearings. Was fed from two Rochester single barrel carburetors and the block was made of aluminum. That That's huge. Plus, this thing's totally different than anything Chevy ever made up to this point or since for that matter. It was a flat six, much like a Boxster engine, that's what they're called, like a Subaru engine or 
Porsche made them too. It's basically flat as a pancake, and instead of the pistons going up and down, they go side to side. Next engine on offer was the base engine in the Monza series. It was a 2687cc, 164 cubic inch displacement, 2.7 liters. It made 110 horsepower at 4400 RPM. Bore and stroke are the same, 3.4 inches on the bore, 2.9 inches on the stroke. Compression is up to 9.25 to 1, four main bearings, aluminum block, two single barrel carburetors. Moving up to the base Corsa engine, it also went by Turbo Air, not to get confused with Turbo because that's coming up later. Turbo Air, same thing, it's a 2687cc, 164 cubic inch displacement, 2.7 liter, it made 140 brake horsepower at 4200 RPM. Bore and stroke are the same, 3.4 inches on the bore, 2.9 inches on the stroke, the block is made out of aluminum, has four main bearings. Compression is 925 to 1, and it was fed through one Rochester four-barrel carburetor. Optional engine was 2683cc, 164 cubic inch displacement, 2.7 liters, but it came with a turbocharger. Yes, you heard that right. This was the first American mass-produced turbocharged car, actually years previous. It was called the Spider. Corvair Spider. I think they started in 63, so just two years prior. Rated at 180 horsepower. Bore and stroke are the same. 3.4 inches on the bore. Stroke is 2.9 inches. Compression is down to 8.25 to 1. Four main bearings. One barrel carb feeding it. Three transmissions on offer. Two-speed automatic, which was the power glide unit. Three-speed manual, as well as a four-speed manual. Moving on to options, not going to get into every single option offered, but some of the ones that stuck out. Tinted glass, seat belts, retracting seat belts, colored floor mats to match the interior of the car, door edge guards, air conditioning, posi traction, 327 rear end, 355 rear end, telescoping steering wheel, hazard lights, backup lights, and they offered lots of radios. All right, so check out this door panel. Up here, it's a different material than down here. It's more of like a vinyl material here. Armrest, door handle, whatever you use it for. Up here is the door handle to get out. And this is the window crank. And that's what the window looks like. Got some vent windows here. Just look at how small these vent windows are. They're really cool. There's also some door pockets small door pockets back here the windows go down as well and this is how they operate all right on to the button switches and knobs starting all the way to the left two switches at the top the one on the left is for the headlights the one right next to it is for the wipers there is a button inside the wipers that is for the windshield washer Coming back, notice, look at the steering wheel and horn ring. One pushes that to press the horn down. I had to explain that to somebody at the car show. They're like, what is that big chrome bar? And I was like, that's for the horn. So I figured I'd just put it in there. There are six pods ahead of the driver. Two large pods that flank for the center pods and the two Starting with the one on the left-hand side has a speedometer, odometer, as well as a tripometer inside of it. Moving to the center gauges, uh, the two at the top, the one on the left-hand side has the clock in it. The one on the right-hand side has temperature. Notice the temperature goes up to 600 degrees because this is an air-cooled car. The other big pod houses the RPM gauge, and it says times 100. It goes up to 6,000. The two bottom gauges... I couldn't get the two bottom gauges to focus. I don't know why Chevy made these dashboards in the 60s where the gauges sit so far down inside the dashboard that you can't really see it that well. So the other two bottom gauges are on the left-hand side is the fuel. On the right-hand side is the cylinder inlet temperature. Notice the climate control placement is right underneath the RPM gauge. All right, glove box test. Here's the... Here's the subject, and here is the glove box. It doesn't.
doesn't fit in the glove box. Ignition switch. This is your ashtray. This is where the cigarette lighter is. This is how much space I have inside underneath the steering wheel. It's adequate. This is what headroom looks like. There's lots, there's lots of headroom in this car. And just check out these sun visors. So just check out this truck. We got the master cylinders on the front here. Notice it doesn't have a power brake booster attached to it. And it's only a single master cylinder. And it's got windshield washer, reservoir, fluid. So if you run out of fluid in the reservoir, there's backup fluid. Notice it has um, electric wipers. The truck's huge. And then if you look in the corner there, that's yes. a stabilizer. No way. There's one in every So place. coming up to the engine compartment, just notice where they put the spare tire. They just lay it right on the side of the engine. This one's got four single barrel carburetors and an alternator. Check out the belt situation. I guess that was always like a problem with these, that they throw belts, and you always have to be aware if you throw a belt because it's air-cooled. It's not water-cooled, so if you throw a belt it's no longer turning the fan, which is no longer cooling the engine, which is a problem. All right, on to the pros and cons. I'm getting all these pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars, Blue Chip Auto Investment, 70 Years, 1930 to 2000, by Richard M. Langworth and the Auto Editors of Consumer Guide. On the positive side, the most desirable Corvair, high appreciation guaranteed. Against it, it says, as for Monza. So we'll go over to the Monza. For the positives, styling, sophisticated ride and roadability from an all-independent suspension, still affordable, great fun to drive. Against it, post-1967 models, though rare, suffer drivability problems as stiffer emissions controls took effect, rust-prone. These cars are still really affordable, and there's a lot of them out there. It's the best entry-level classic car, in my opinion. Thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, toodaloo!